You could uh, just mention that we've just done the screen capture and the interference of our cameras. Oh yes, yeah, we've just been uh, capturing the setting sun from our window here, perfectly positioned to be doing it, and uh, the odd behaviour of the sun that we've been witnessing, it uh, setting from the north, moving across to the left of our window frame and then gets down low in the sky and ends up heading towards the right and being right in the middle. Anyway. It indicates that the axis of the Earth shifted right before our eyes. Yeah, absolutely. About two degrees. So this PowerPoint is really astounding. It's all derived from the most wonderful gift of love and free will. Quoting scriptures, certain men have crept in unawares. A quote from scripture, ungodly men, Jude 1 4. Meeting His Holiness Pope Benedict XVI was a wonderful experience for us. Absolutely, a man so sweet in nature, humble, doing everything he could to the letter of my laws, loving and forgiving. A man we soon realized was completely unaware of the depths of evil in the world, a pure and innocent heart. Privately, Father Giuseppe agreed that Pope Benedict was unaware of what was really happening in the world. He kept being so busy with the business and ceremony of the church. The Pope and I talked for hours. I told him of my doings throughout my life. I could not explain the reasons I do what I do. What he gathered was a sense of appalling anger that the world would treat Christ this way. He simply said he did not understand how they could. I looked for the longest time at a photograph of himself walking along a hall chatting to the Queen, and they were friends. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Pope Benedict asked us how, how was Elizabeth uh, when we were communicating with him. I felt that the Queen was in the same situation as himself, cut off from the real world and what drives all evils, so entrenched she think so entrenched she, I think, has a better grasp of the devil in high places, and she would have empathy with his holiness. She, I suspect, is totally unaware. We served Her Majesty with a notice of claim in 2010. As a child, George VI told her, when she is queen, that should the Christ make his presence known to her, then she was to hand over the throne to him, as it is the throne of David held in trust for Christ. His Holiness Pope Benedict XVI has the same command, but he, as the Vicar of Christ, acts as Christ, being head of the Church, and as such will know when the man who comes is the Christ, and is why he did not require all of the thousands of proofs I have presented to the world at large. He looked at my face and was convinced. Before the devil caused good men to break from the Church, a pope would make sure the emerging kingdoms would remain loyal to Jesus. But as it warns in Matthew 8.44 of the devil and the descendant of Cain, a parable we see in Jude 1.4, this is what has occurred being relevant today. As I only wanted to convince the two most important people on earth, it is an absolute certainty the queen has been kept completely in the dark. But we do have a slight advantage. I am not here to convince the world. And as many of you know, I am very quick to tell anyone to get stuffed and ban them from any comments. Notwithstanding, an enemy becomes my friend by warning others of my false prophecies and whatever else I saw as an opportunity to perpetuate the rejection process. Psalms 118.22 but today I am at the door, Revelation 3, 20, 21, 22. The two heads of the churches, Pope Benedict XVI and Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Standing on the seventh floor of our hotel, the Grand Burston, a couple stood with us outside the only lift. He said his name was Marshall. His wife Anne was from Cornwall. He complained of an altercation with his son, and as he had a bad heart, they were getting away from the stress by a night at the hotel. We spoke of the straw man money scam and the evils we all know behind the war in Syria. As we said good night, he said, how do I know they are not MI5? 
I replied, I hope you are. The British are much too smart to let an opportunity slip. We had been to Arbroath Monastery on the 30th of May, 2013. The connection to Pope Benedict the 16th we will explain in another upload. However, the history of Stirling Castle and Arbroath Monastery, built by the Benedictine monks, ordered and financed by King William I to the line, links to Pope Benedict the 16th. But to get to the bottom of the alterations to history by English influence on the reality of King William and myself is in a roundabout way linked to Glastonbury. We'd flown to Edinburgh to buy a car. The rentals in Rome, a fee at 500 per month is equivalent to the price of a Rover diesel. Rover 75 diesel, 2001, in Edinburgh. MI6 had stopped two deals we'd made from Rome by mobile phone. We always bait the spy agencies to test their awareness and let them know we are in control. In Edinburgh, the local phone booth was also MI5, but finally we were allowed to purchase a Rover diesel for £800 that MI5 had set up. Jam packed with tracking devices, etc., and armed with it, we left a trail to Stirling Castle, then on to Arbroath Monastery, 75 miles east towards the coast. Many photos. The next move was the headquarters of the Church of Scotland in Edinburgh, at 121 George Street at about 9 a.m. and we were fined for parking at 9.24 a.m. May 31st 2013. Thank you. Location and time duly recorded. Ash spoke to the reception of Shauna showing the evidence of the incarceration of Pope Benedict the 16th but a brute of an elderly overweight woman, poorly dressed woman, security, <laughs> actually she was Shauna's boss, we insisted she make photocopies. She said they did not have a photocopier, but we insisted and she left reception and made the copies. As expected, this same woman, with obvious disdain for the Pope, our presence, in particular an Australian, saying I was Christ, questioning my Scottish ancestry. Then she asked, who is the Galatly Marshal, glancing up from the proclamation we had sent the Queen? I replied, me. The receptionist, on the other hand, said quietly she was meeting with the head of the church, Lorna, she the moderator of the General Assembly, the following night, June the 1st, 2013, and would make sure she was given the information. Adding to the situation, Lorna is also the Queen's chaplain, meeting the Queen June the 4th, marking the 60th anniversary of her coronation. On to Glastonbury, to the Georgian Pilgrims, located on the corner of High Street and Benedict Street, and opposite a church built in 1885 named St. Benedict. Across the road, the Benedict Old Age Facility and the Benedict Children's Centre. We arrived only to be told the booking, or we found out we weren't told by any person. I went into my email and found out it had been cancelled. Thank you, MI5. It was already late afternoon, it was actually after 7, and to drive to Dover, where Ash had already made a backup reservation in case of such an incident, meant a three-hour, 200-mile drive. Driving through the town, intending to return the next day, a lane leading up to Glastonbury Tor, we drove up to familiarise ourselves for the return. Atop the tour is St Michael's Tower, a fair hike up from the parking area, a trail up to the 521 foot high tour. Independently we both sensed there was something odd about the scene. Ash was feeling quite ill. I was too, sensing something tragic. Nearing the top, the concrete steps led up the south side. I had my arm around her near the top. She said she was okay and I walked to the last few steps ahead, then turned taking a photo. The scene was not normal. Something was missing. I took many photographs and normally avoid people in the shot, but had taken two couples, one near the car park and the other near a gate, on the path as we started our climb. On the hill, Ash was still feeling odd and leant against the south side of the tour, while I walked to the arch on the west side, déjà vu. Feeling better, we walked inside the tour. In the distance to the east, a circular stone drew our attention. 60 feet or so, and on the stone a stainless steel sundial with the cardinal points north, south, east, west. It was odd, not placed directly, but west of the tower, perhaps four feet off the centre line northward. 
We photographed the sunset, I noticing it was too far north, about 26 degrees off true north. We were still unable to discern what was odd about the place, then as the sun was setting, the light changed to dark in seconds, yet the sky was unobstructed, then bright again. This odd light changing, reminding me of our photos of Antarctica, showing the sun dimming over ten minutes to become bright, only to dim repeatedly. We started back down, stopped at a pool, reported to have miraculous powers, restoring youthfulness, and we drank some water. Then, we didn't know that then, we just found out later, then sat in the car, turned on the TomTom -tom GPS and set it for the address near Dover at the pre-booked hotel. These were coordinates that were given on the um, website when I was booking the hotel. The GPS indicated the address was 88.8 .8 miles from where we'd parked the car. The time on the TomTom -tom was 20.34, that's 8.34, and the estimated time of arrival would be 22.22. The distance to turn around was 110, oh, that should be yards actually, south, and the Greek number, of course, for 110 means immortality. <coughs> the Hebrew concordance number for 2034 means something demolished ruined, which is what happened to the church atop the mountain, which is precisely what had occurred when Henry VIII ordered it destroyed. It's called the dissolution of the monasteries, and it happened all over Scotland and uh, England. Ash handed the GPS to me at 2035 and 222888. The 2222 is Isaiah, Key of David, and of course I weighed 222 pounds and 74 inches tall which is 3 times 74 is 222. Two, two. Now we returned to Glastonbury, the tour, on the 3rd of June. Stopped before dawn at Stonehenge, parking on the north side to observe sunrise. And as we did so a group of researchers in the sun side the stones were observing the sunrise contrary to past recorded observations we determined the sun was out by 28.5 degrees and i felt it would reach 28.61 degrees any day before or on summer solstice we then drove on to glastonbury another 60.6 kilometers as the crow flies what we we had determined what and why the odds seen on the 31st of May and that date was also our five-year anniversary so the next slides we start with our first visit to the Glastonbury tour on the 31st of May taken minutes apart now this is me Ash climbing before the winds hit us both near the top and uh, if you look <laughs> yes what is wrong with the image Again, 31st of May, 2013. These are just moments apart. I took many shots and as said, some 20 metres eastward, not in a direct line, perpendicular to the tower, a round stone with a plaque set east and slightly north. Odd as it logically should have been placed by a team unfamiliar with church protocol, back in 1982, as the Catholic churches always faced directly east. The tower was correct. It was the later placement of the stone that indicated a shift in the earth geographically, as the church was no longer east-west orientation. The next slide was taken on June the 3rd. Sunset north. Yes. North. Mm. Sunrise just off south. Mm. Should be east and should be west. So we returned on June the 3rd, 2013, after observing the sunset on June the 2nd, 2013, when we took a Magellan GPS recording the sunset toward the north from Dover. The observations were recorded from several positions, the sun setting around 20 degrees off true north. Then on June the 3rd, the following morning, we stopped at Stonehenge on our way back to Glastonbury to compare the shadows to our first encounter, seeing none 
on May the 31st, and that was the oddity of that day. There were absolutely no shadows at all while we were on the tour. Now this is the stone henge uh, at sunrise on June the 3rd, the 1769 Cook observed the transition of Venus. This is the very, very tip of the sun coming up through the trees. Huh, that's an odd, that's still, the colouring is still odd, isn't it, honey? Mm, it's very odd. Mm, look at that. And that's a beautiful camera, right? Mm. Not clear at all. No. And it was already much brighter than that because mm. it started mm. getting bright from, what, 2.30 when we yeah, stopped for gas? Yeah, that's right. Now, he, th these are our own shots. <laughs> Take them. You can see how clear the camera is here. That's right. Takes a beautiful shot. See all the people around. We were giving our own little lecture. Yah was lecturing on it. This in the afternoon. Mm, yes, this, yeah, this is much later in the afternoon. But look how lovely. Hmm. So, just a quick word on Stonehenge. The measure around it is 316.8 feet. Of course, Lord Jesus Christ, Greek Gematria, Lord 800, Jesus 888, Christ 1480, add them all together, 3168. And it was never a completed structure. Logic will prevail here. Some of the stones weigh 80 tons. They are mortised at the top so that a hollow fits over the mortise. There is no way any earthquake could topple a structure completed with 30 uprights and 30 lintels forming a circle. Mortised at the top so that a hollow of the lintels fit onto it. You can see one right there in the centre. So where are the six tonne missing lintels or the 80 tonne uprights? Well, it was obviously dragged off by a <laughs> to build a fence somewhere. Yeah, right. So to put it in perspective, one third of the uprights are in the limestone ground, immovable alone, but imagine joined in a circle. Armageddon, that is what it is all about. 60.6 .6 kilometres to Glastonbury Tor as the crow flies. Four times 60.6 .6 is Jesus 2424. Now, what was that uh, one two one two, which is the distance? Well, Revelation one two one two, well into the earth, the devils come oh, down. Oh, twelve here. twelve, of course, yes. Yeah, that's two times sixty point six because we travelled on the same day. We travelled there and back. Right. As the crow flies, we did road miles, not as a crow, but that's the measure that you are. As the crow flies, so we watched sunrise from west of Stonehenge, several hundred meters, rising. At about the same angle of true, of off, true north, true north <laughs> twenty-eight degrees. Off twenty-eight degrees. It's all right. I'm <laughs> You're missing an F there, babe. <laughs> this is impossible under I'll normal. Start again. Then. <laughs> no, it's okay. This is impossible under normal Earth axis orientation, as the sun is never this high in the north in summer. The latitude around fifty-one degrees. Duration normally 978 minutes, rise at 4.59 and set at 8.34 by our clock equals 15 hours and 33 minutes, but still light in Glastonbury. Now the same latitude, 933 minutes with 42 minutes to go because the official uh, internet time was 9.16 for that day, although we couldn't see it by the time we left. However, back on top of the tour, I photographed the sun was seen in the next photo, the clear view of the horizon, we at 521 feet above the area. And here it is. Now in some order of time as per camera phone on the tour looking Ma May 31st, 2013. Note the darkness. The phone was set for Rome time, so we have to add two hours. So it, it's, it is 8.20.38. We watch sun. Oh, this is a. Okay. Maybe it's out of awakening. Yeah, we'll skip this one because that's a repeat. So here we go. S moving right along to our revisit. The next slide Glastonbury tour for June the 3rd.
the sundial with a very reliable older type Magellan, <laughs> Magellan, Magellan GPS laid along the north-south line. That stick on the right is the actual north-south line laid on top of the marker. Yes. Now, in the Magellan, there's a, a marker up in the top right corner. Shows you the new north, magnetically and uh, geographically. The point here is the GPS is calculating the direction I walk 20 metres toward the stone sundial in line with the black rods. I place north-south on the dial indicator. Absolute. However, according to the GPS, the north is 28 degrees to the top right of the screen. As this was set by ourselves the, the night before when we did the same in several locations driving towards the sunset. The roads turn and so does the indicator. Therefore, when it is pointing north, we can compare England indicates the pole shift. That's so much depth. So you're looking north, as England moved over to the left by that many degrees. It remains to be seen how fast the axis wobble will continue. It will settle down as the solar system travels north at 69,000 kilometres above the Milky Way galaxy equatorial line. Being above means the solar system is back into where creation occurred in the north. This is why the Coriolis effect can be seen in the clouds. Weather, sinkholes, tidal flow and the moon no longer upright as it also wobbles after December 11th in 2011 at 11.11am 11, 11 the east coast of Australia when we filmed the moon flip 180 degrees in an hour then settled down over the next few weeks. Water draining in Europe was clockwise and changed to counterclockwise and Australia too clockwise. Now back to our first visit we were still baffled by the odd scene on the tour. We took many shots then walked back down the west side turning north near the car park. We drank water from the pool, sat in the car, turned on the tom-tom. Ash had booked near Dover, so it was in the GPS. She had given me the coordinates, but it had placed the location 88.8 .8 miles away, and we knew our hotel was 206 miles away. Now, when I actually did that in the computer, it was 65.7. Uh, wasn't 88.8, .8. but the Tom Tom was out. No, well, well it no, the Tom Tom was 88.8. .8. I put yeah. the coordinates into the computer, and it was uh, 65. .7. But was that as the crow fly? Yeah, of course. Well, then, the, but the Tom Tom's not as the crow fly. Oh, I see. What you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you're right. So it was both. Yeah. One confirms the other. They're both the Lord numbers. That's right. Yeah. The Tom, the time on the Tom Tom GPS showed our first odd situation. The time on the directions from Glastonbury after we'd experienced what can only be described as the twilight zone. We had purchased new SIM cards for the phones the day before. This is in the United Kingdom. The time on both phones were correct Rome time. However, the TomTom -tom was two hours ahead because it was on UK time. And we saw a series of sacred numbers. The time was 2034 when Ash looked at, looked at it but had to start the camera again, so it gained a minute by the time I gave it over to Ya. And it was 2035, 2222, and 888, also 110. So that number 2034 is something demolished, ruin, and we had just returned from the ruins. The St. Michael's Tower is what remains of the two, there are actually two churches on top of the tour, but both of them were ruined. So now back to the start. On the tour known as St. Michael's Tower, inside on the south wall was a sign. It mentions that Richard Whiting was hung. He, the last abbot of the Glastonbury Abbey, but fails to mention why. He and two monks were murdered. The explanation in the Abbey of Glastonbury says that Henry VIII saw him as a rival. Leaving out facts indicates the truth is not a factor. It leaves out that he and two monks had been drawn and quartered. So they were hung, drawn and quartered. Oh, God. 
for not handing over sacred documents concerning what is known as the Colburn Bible. Now this is information that is within the Colburn yeah. in the opening pages. You won't find it elsewhere. So the men were tied behind horses, dragged to the tor, then horses on either side tied the men in the middle between the horses. I can't even read this. You can read it yourselves. I'm not going to. I'm skipping along. Henry VIII had the entire church and abbey destroyed, stealing all its wealth and er eradicating it as a rival influence in England. As well, he destroyed all monasteries in what is known as the dissolution of the monasteries. So as history is written by the victors, then the gory details and omissions are par for the course. What is not mentioned is why the area once contained 60 universities where I, as Jesus, taught people from all over the ancient world. The Colburn Bible contains what I, as God, by myself, Jesus, had passed on to the world. Henry VIII of England had demanded the last abbot of Glastonbury, Abbot Richard Whiting, surrender all of the ancient manuscripts, but he would not, and it cost him and two monks their lives. Abbot Richard Whiting knew the evils of Henry VIII and in refusing was signing his own death warrant and he was murdered on November the 15th, 1539. I did. Ash felt progressively sick as we climbed. She said very weird, unusual, so much so I had to support her. She also said she felt awestruck. Inside on the wall the plaques of the building was 521 feet above the plain and 521 is the word for Amma, the number corresponding to the mother Cubit 520. The following series of photographs we looked at briefly. Tired from driving from Edinburgh as we arrived at 4.30 a.m. near Dover, that, that what should have taken us three hours to drive 200 miles ended up taking us six. There were so many delays and uh, obstructions along the way and it was in the dead of night there was <laughs> it was just twilight zone we went through the photographs and several times trying to get a grip on what had occurred violent winds as we reached the top almost blowing us over ash found a spot and leaned against the wall to gain her composure that's for sure i walked through the tour it has two arched doorways and several metres to the south is the circular stone with the metal plaque, north, south, east, west, and distances to locations. So this is uh, me, Ash, climbing the last few, well, actually isn't the last few feet, but climbing up south, south, before the winds hit us, which was near the top. And But, you know, what's, what's wrong with the image, apart from my hair? What is wrong? There is no shadow, absolutely none. And as you look at the rest of these photos, you will see no shadows anywhere. <sighs> Freaky. None on my face. And this is the comparison. First day we were there, and then to return on the 3rd of June. So I took this on the way up, drinking from it on the way back. The pool sprang up miraculously in ancient times. And it is said that anybody who drinks from it will have eternal youth. But again, no shadows. That's the whole point. No shadows anywhere. There's reflection, but not shadows. The following photo shows the darkness surrounding the tour, yet later it is bathed in light. And again, no shadows. The darkness is gone, the sky was clear, and suddenly bathed in light again. The scene changed again, the sun was setting. Now, the sun is still there in the sky, it's coming through the cloud cover, which was only over the, the sun, they've been chemtrailing daily to cover up the sun. Um, and darkness was to the north, and we know a sun does not set in the north. Clear skies, why dark? Inside the tour I took several shots. There appeared to be light coming from two-thirds of the way up. Shadows. And lower, no shadows. So 
So I sat on the uh, stone plaque as I, as Yah wandered about trying to photograph this odd situation. The wind, it was very strong. Bright light, no shadows. The darkness cleared, yet no clouds. It was if the sun was dimming, yet light surrounded the tor. It's totally bizarre. You see how bright it is elsewhere. Yet, on the side where the sun is, Now down the hill we drove from the parking, um, 300 yards or so, we saw a small lane and drove to the end, the small house, everything's bright and clear. Driving back still confused by the odd light, just a few seconds later. Bright light, gone, Michael's Tower, dark, clear skies, you can see the blue in the sky above. All is clear. At least ten minutes earlier we took a photograph from the tower looking west. Almost dark. Then back to the car. Bright. <laughs> Drove to the house. Bright daylight. Time was after 20.35 as per the GPS. And we drove back towards Glastonbury in bright daylight. Darkening again suddenly. Now, in some order of time as per camera phone on the tour, looking north, Google Maps, darkness, uh, remembering that uh, time is actually 8.20 set for. And here it is, on the other side, looking south, bright day, no shadow. Just eight seconds later, yeah, I turned around and walked a few feet. You can see there, there's only eight seconds difference, but different sides of the tour. There's no shadows have, under the trees. Did you open that window again? I didn't. I thought you did. Mm, well, I did. Someone's opened it. Okay. So at 6.20.45 p.m., no shadows under the trees. In the tower, 59 seconds later, shadows on all four sides. But lower down, no shadows. and the light is directly above. Yes, according to the internet, the sun set was 9.16 on that day. Now why, what is it we were witnessing? As said, when we were in Coolum Beach, east coast of Australia, daily we recorded 10 minute intervals of the sun growing dim, then bright, then dim and bright and so on. Now, the second phenomenon, quite separate to the tour casting no shadows, is due to what I would recommend you read, the book concerning the how, <laughs> the venerable bead. The title of the book is The Venerable Bead. He reports in the 650 AD era that when saints were killed, the area would have a light reach up into the heavens, something like this. The Venerable Bede was a priest who lived and recorded the, the events during the 7th century. He reported solar eclipses, and I found he was accurate. He reported where a saint may have died in battle or murdered. Light would glow straight up to heaven, and eventually the locals would build a church in honour. The tour, three men murdered, protecting Jesus. We have the series of photographs showing light and shadow, directly down from above, sh shadows on four walls, the same after 8 p.m., and light, no shadows on the southern side of the 521 feet high hill. Driving through Glastonbury, we found a cafe, La Terre, and walked in for a meal. The time was 8.58.48, it's still light. It was actually a few minutes before that, but when Ya took the movie inside the... Uh, cafe that was the time the time was back to normal then a man came in he a wine salesman who sold wine in county fairs he had favorites and most were organic from small growers and in great demand at the bar he could not read the label so I offered him my magnifying glasses for the small print 
He was already drunk, yet although he had had a trailer, he had a trailer full of wine, he was purchasing more wine. He ordered another bottle. I took a photo in the mirror, the time on the camera, light bright from outside. We invited him to join us and talked for, um, it was actually about an hour and a half, I think. We left in the dark driving to Dover. It was around 10.30, maybe 10.40 when we left. Our hotel, Ash had booked, it had been mysteriously cancelled. N15 did it. And so as Ash had already booked four days near Dover, starting the same date of the cancelled Glastonbury, George and Pilgrim's Hotel on First and Benedict Streets, Note the white camera showing in the mirror. The same for all photos, so that time would be in sequence and shows the light changing. Yeah, holding the white phone camera. Time in the camera, 6.58.48. This is in the Café La Terre. And yes, I remember walking in and looking at the clock. It was uh, about 8.52 by the time we got there, because we I asked if they were still open. He said the kitchen was going to be open for a few more minutes and it was all good. So now I'd gone to the car and yes, the, the lights were on. The car is an automatic shut off when the ignition is turned off. There were no headlights on, there were just the uh, rear parking lights at the back. Not even the, Not even the front parking lights were on. Anyway, it was all very bizarre. But they do, they shut off um, automatically. In the photo, the lights were on, but who or what has the ignition turned on? The parking lights only work when the with the ignition switched on. Oh, these are not. Yeah, these are the parking lights. No parking lights reflecting off the BMW. So two days later, I returned to the car, and the windshield wipers were on again. No key in the ignition. That's what got into the car. Wind <laughs> windshield wipers. We're on. Bizarro. Now here, back on the tour, the blue line is the direction of the sunset in the northwest. Around it, the tower casting no shadow in any direction. All around, there was no shadow anywhere on that tower. Next slide, 24 seconds later, the tower is bright, no shadows other than from light above. Yet inside the tower, the area is uniformly darker, indicating the light source is a glow rather than directional. Directional. By that I mean bead the priest record records shows light from the death locations would shine up to heaven and then locals would build a church. Now this of course these ruins were here when Richard Whiting and the two monks were martyred. It was already there. Yes, look at these. No shadows. This image here was taken off the internet. Uh, who knows how old it is? No idea. However, you can see that the sun is uh, in the westerly correct position where it's supposed to be setting. Sun casting shadow from the east, Google Earth.
this was another shot when uh, it's setting where it's supposed to the sun through the tower setting in the west but way north 26 degrees off the north pole northwest the arches are only on two sides east and west the path is to the west while the shadow is north means the sun is south today the axis wobble at sunset casts a shadow southwest as the sun sets north east it should be northwest huh right. there we go Correction there on that other slide. Yes, so these are internet pictures where uh, the sun is setting west where it's supposed to. So we followed a trail around this is now this is on our return. You can see the shadow there this day, this was June the third. We followed a trail around St. Michael starting east to the west where a path approaches the west side of the building. Our camera caught the sun east of the building. Again, a clear blue sky. Now in Australia I took thousands of photographs of the sun. The camera caught a dark dot in the center, it a filter. What these revealed was the sun would brighten then darken. The temperature on the black rubber mats did not get hot at all. We arrived in Glastonbury after sunrise and I took a series of shots from the township along a lane leading to the parking area of Glastonbury Tor and St Michael's Church. As we drove, there are trees and fences, but overall the sky can be seen. I noticed looking at the sun, it suddenly flashed. The time was 6.30.54 a.m. And these next 16 shots are two minutes start to finish. We parked and then walked around the trail on the south side to locate a second path up to the summit up the western side and started to take a series of shots of the sun as we made the ascent. You can see St Michael's with remains of the church looming over the tall hill and the sun against a brilliant blue sky. As we got closer the building is progressively larger in the shot. The sun is glowing brighter then flashes and then fades back to, to least bright. It was doing the same as it did in Australia from 2010 onwards, grows bright and then dims repeatedly. Yes, you can see, that's a brilliant shot there, walking up the path, you can see how off the sun is. It's rising south 
It's rising from the southeast. If it were where it's supposed to be, it would be uh, right behind St. Michael's Tower as I'm going up the path there because I'm approaching from the west side. Yeah, I was drawing a red circle so that you can um, see how it grows and flashes and shrinks. Yes, you can see how far out it is compared to the internet shot where it was in the position that it should be. How long ago? We don't know. Will the sun grow darker until it stops shining altogether? It's happened before. Dinosaurs worldwide have been found frozen solid with food still in their mouths. The sun going out caused it. Death from the cold would take but a few days. Clearly the photos we have shown you thus far is directly caused by the sun's light dimming, then shine once again. The USA has thousands of miles of tunnels going underground. They are aware of the danger. It is logical as the deeper you go, the warmer. And this is why they have been building underground shelters since World War II. The world of animals with hands, Talmud interpretation of the Western world, where they become the Semite, not Mongolian Khazar, which is what they are, when the reverse is true, you are the chosen people made in God's image, the Semite. They are the Goy. It's all a reversal. John 8:44. These are descendants of Cain, a murderer. A parable, of course, but all things are told in parables. Incidentally, the word parable is my name in Hebrew, Mashal. As I have not been here, the devil's own run amuck creating hell knowing its end is at hand and wants to destroy you and the creation as they are going to be destroyed they start wars the threat of world war three chemtrails manufactured diseases vaccinations stirring up religions and in particular against christianity the antichrist must demonize his holiness and the queen both innocent victims caught in its web thus far the pope has announced Christ is back. What would the world think if the Queen did the same? The Queen and the Pope Benedict the Sixteenth are being held responsible for the atrocities of the churches have allowed to occur for hundreds of years. Tried in abstention and found guilty by the... It's actually the ITTC. <laughs> <laughs> the World Trade Center, WTC. All right. And each, there, yeah, uh, all right, babe. <laughs> and each face a 25-year jail sentence. The aim is to disgrace both so that no one would listen to these holy people demonized by the devil in high places. All to forbid Christ. Protocol 14. Learned elders of Zion. That is the Talmud. No media has told the story concerning Benedict's announcement that Christ is back. The Pope believed he had met Christ and no one listened because he was set up to be the church beast. This has been a long, drawn-out, full-on work of evil as they knew where and when I would be reborn, Catholic and British. My first passport in Australia was British, my second Australian. Christ is a Catholic and British. Pope Benedict XVI and Queen Elizabeth, the end time witnesses. And here he is, the one that it's all about, Brian Leonard Golightly Marshall, the Lord Jesus Christ, the end.